everyone, it's Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church. I want to welcome you to this video. This is the third video in our response to Truth Time Radio. If you haven't watched the first and the second one, the first one being on the history teacher barks back, the second one being the first one on the plagiarism issues surrounding the Noah Webster blog, we would encourage you to end, stop this video and go watch those two first as these videos are building on each other. I'd like to welcome you here to our YouTube channel, Grace Life Bible on YouTube. If you haven't already done so, if you would consider subscribing and ringing the alarm bell as a means of staying current with the church and our ministry as we go live from our assembly building on Sunday mornings, as well as create content for you here midweek, we would appreciate you joining our audience and, and are glad, as always, that you have tuned in. Our featured book currently is my new release from This Generation Forever, Volume 1, Inspiration. This is the first 27 lessons of my adult Sunday school class from This Generation Forever, where we have been studying issues related to inspiration, preservation, canonicity, transmission, translation, um, very extensive study on issues related to the biblical text, and most particularly of late, the King James Bible and many details surrounding its history. If you haven't already done so, consider picking one of those up uh, we, as a means of supporting the ministry. We would certainly appreciate it. And we also want to remind you about our Rumble channel here, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. We established this in uh, 2021 as an alt tech site, should something happen to our YouTube ministry. So if you're into alt tech sites or would like an alternative for YouTube, please consider subscribing and joining us here as well. So what I want to do in this third video is I want to jump right in and start off and start where we left off in the previous video. <clears throat> in the second video, we were addressing the plagiarism issue and the fact that Truth Time Radio massively plagiarized their blog on No Webster and then sought to cover their tracks. And we went into all the details on that. So in the revised blog uh, dated April 20. There are two terse, short, and insufficient source citations to the resources that Truth Time Radio originally plagiarized and had available in the public space. We also demonstrated that even in its current manifestation, in its April 20th dating, there are still four instances of uh, copy-paste plagiarism that Truth Time Radio has failed to give attribution to. Now, I ended the last video talking about these terse and insufficient and extremely sketchy manner in which Truth Time Radio is um, giving attribution. So I want to point out again that only the name of the author and the years are given. There is nothing, there are no titles of the articles, no names of the journals in which these things appeared, no website links uh, shared where people could go look at these things on, on their own. There's virtually as minuscule as information available as possible provided here uh, so as to cover their tracks in the most sort of insufficient way possible. Now, why would they uh, give such anemic uh, source citations? I think there are two possibilities here. The first one is they're trying to cover up plagiarism. So the more extensive they are, the more ability people are going to have to go check out what, they, what, what they've done. And by any standards, academic or otherwise, these source citations are not sufficient and do not cut the mustard. So reason number one is related to the covering up of the plagiarism. Number two, the second reason for hiding the source, I believe, is because of what sources are being plagiarized. Okay, Twelve paragraphs total are plagiarized here, four, uh, nine of which are taken from this article here by Jess McHugh in the Paris Review. The Nationalist Roots of the Marian Webster, the Nationalist Roots of Marian Webster Dictionary. Now you can see right here the Nationalist Roots. This is uh, this is key language to clue you in to the point of view and the perspective that Jess McHugh is writing from. We would expect to find an anti-nationalist sort of uh, bent from McHugh in this piece. All right, and if we look at some of the things that are said here, let's look at the first two paragraphs. Amid the rankest screaming matches of political discourse in 2016, a tempering voice emerged from an unlikely source, the dictionary. So this is obviously talking about the political climate in the during the uh, Trump election of 2016. During the presidential election and its aftermath, Marion Webster's dictionary mobilized its large social media following to, quote, fact check political uh, figures 
who treated all language like fiction. From explaining the meaning of fact to differentiating between bigly and big league, the dictionary served as a biting challenge to the new regime, winning praise for its pithy critiques. So what Just McHugh is talking about here is how the dictionary challenged the new regime, i.e. the Trump administration, and the political discourse, and she's discussing here the role the dictionary played in all this. Merriam-Webster's uh, resistance to an administration steeped in nativism, again, clearly referring to uh, Trumpism, however, is complicated by the dictionary's original goal to create a pervasive, to create and preserve a, a monolithic American culture. No Webster Jr., the dictionary's founding author, is one of the first American nationalists, and he wrote his reference books with the express purpose of creating a single definition of American English, one that often existed at the expense of regional or cultural variation of any kind. So the first thing we want to notice here is that the article that Truth Time Radio is choosing to plagiarize is written from a from a politically leftist stance. All right. It is critical of these things and it is critical of Webster. If we come down here and look at the sixth paragraph, Webster grew up in Hartford, Connecticut, where where he where he was an 18 year old Yale student. All right. When the Revolutionary War broke out, we're going to skip down to, uh, for the sake of time, this statement. Webster's contemporaries and his biographers have called him a zealot and even earned, and he even earned the nickname, the monarch, for his attitude of superiority. Quote, he was basically one of the most politically correct, incorrect men alive, unquote. Joshua Kendall, author of The Forgotten Founding Father, Noah Webster's obsession with the uh, with the creation of an American culture, that is this book right here, The Forgotten Founding Father by Kendall, told me on the phone, quote, today Webster would be like a standard policy wonk on Sean Hannity, this right-wing, angry white man. So we can see here very clearly that this article by Jess McHugh is written from a leftist stance. It calls him an American nationalist, okay? It calls um, Webster a right-wing, angry white man. So Webster was a right-wing, angry white man who would have been a policy wonk on Sean Hannity, according to the article that True Time Radio was choosing to plagiarize. It is my personal opinion that one of the reasons, or a second reason why True Time Radio does not give the name of the article, where the article can be found, is because there are elements of this that probably some of the readership of True Time Radio's blog would probably be um, not necessarily on board with. So what True Time Radio does then is they extend the argumentation of McHugh in their article and they expand on it. They extend McHugh's article and expand on it in ways and um, paint Webster in the most in, in the worst possible light possible uh, is what what we're going to see here. Now, here at the top of page four, there's a statement about his, uh, the Truth Time Radio talks about the definition of repent. There's language over here in the margin on the right that deals with that. I'm not going to cover that explicitly in the video. This document on the screen will be linked in the description underneath this video if you want to check that out for yourself. I want to jump in here into how Truth Time Radio extends the philosophy and the opinion of Webster that they are gaining from McHugh, whom they are plagiarizing. Let's look here at Pink. While some will assume that just because Noah Webster cited verses from the King James Bible with his definitions, it somehow validates the belief of his dictionary being the superior mode of usage in defining terms within the scriptures, most will ignore his ulterior motives. If the very title of the dictionary, including the words American language, is not enough of a clue <clears throat> that this is not the appropriate book to rely on for deciphering words in the English from England, not American translation of scriptures. I don't know what is. So, what True Time Radio? What is True Time Radio talking about here? No Webster provided examples from the King James Bible to support the meaning and usage of words in America. Is this not what one would expect given the English roots of our nation? Did English not develop along a different trajectory here in North America than it did across the pond in the mother country? By including word uses examples from the King James Bible, 
Webster is noting the immense impact the King James Bible had on American culture, not the other way around. Truth Time Radio is ass uh, assigning sinister motives to Webster via the woke, anti-nationalist author they chose to plagiarize, i.e. Jess McHugh. So what Truth Time Radio is doing is they are extending the argumentation that they're lifting from the McHugh article and plagiarizing now, and they are going to advance it to pin extremely sinister motives on what Webster is doing. The fact that Webster uses King James Bible references and verses to define words in English bespeaks the influence of the King James Bible on American culture, not the other way around. But True Time Radio is trying to flip this and paint Webster in the worst possible way, as we see here in the next section. Look at this section in orange. Webster made no attempts to hide his theological beliefs from anyone, nor did he veil the fact that he hated the usage and terminology, terminology, that, terminology and phrases that were not often employed within his locale of New England. Obviously, dialects and language differ throughout America, with the exception of native peoples who were either exterminated or indentured into slavery. America was made up solely of immigrants from various parts of the world who spoke different languages. While a common language is necessary for communication, Webster made no secret of the fact that he abhorred the usage of certain language and dialects within America, which he was not accustomed to. In other words, Webster wanted to be the one who chose how Americans communicated and spoke based on his own prejudices and biases without regard for the interests of others, and to this end, he was most successful. But Webster's interest in redefining and eliminating certain phrases and terms did not end with his 1828 dictionary. He felt he had more work to do. And his next venture would be his most noticed, most imperialistic undertaking, his audacious revision of the King James Bible. For a man who despised the linguistic nature of the very book he claimed to revere, this was the only logical step for the self-titled lexographer. His two-year Yale education earned him a position of, uh, of a school teacher. He didn't study law there, as has been claimed by some publications. Because, we because Webster knew the King James Bible was the most used book in educating American youth at the time, even more so than his extremely popular, quote, blueback speller, he knew that his dream of authoring a single common language for America would never come to fruition as long as the American people were still relying so heavily on the book, King James Bible, that did not reflect his goals. Now, we have some things to say here, all right? Now, first of all, the portion of the portion at right highlighted in orange is notable for two reasons. First, given the extremely <clears throat> sorry, given the extensively plagiarized nature of this article, we are flagging this section as questionable. Put another way, we suspect plagiarism in these in these three paragraphs as well, but cannot prove it at these time at this time. I have read extensively The Forgotten Founding Father uh, by Joshua Kendall, and that is this book right here. And I am largely convinced that there are things that are lifted in these three paragraphs from Kendall's book that um, are not cited or given attribution here. And this is the same Kendall who wrote this book right here from the line we just quoted from. So I believe there are further instances and possibly also from this book, The Life of Noah Webster, the times, uh, the life, no Webster, the life and times of, of an American patriot. So I believe there possibly is more plagiarism here that Truth Time Radio has failed to give attribution to just based upon the extensive nature of the plagiarism thus far. Second, these three paragraphs constitute a vicious attack on the character and motives of Noah Webster, thereby making their undocumented nature all the more troubling. According to Truth Time Radio, Noah Webster was an evil imperialist and linguistic Nazi who sought to subjugate all Americans to his New England elitism and authoritarian wordsmithing. The revising of the Bible was but the end of his diabolical imperialist plan, according to Truth Time Radio. If these truly are Truth Time Radio's own words, they are the most revealing three paragraphs in the entire article. Folks, that this there's virtually no doubt in my mind that there's probably other instances of plagiarism here. Dropping down now to page... Five, 
this section here in pink. This means that today, Noah Webster would be an advocate for new modern versions of Scripture because currently we do not speak the same way we did in the 1800s. Today, Noah Webster would either pick his favorite modern Bible version and promote it as a standard, or he would just create a new one himself. But one thing is certain, he would not advocate for, for that standard to be the King James Bible. Let's be clear on that. So let's come over here to the left margin. Well, Webster clearly thought that aspects of the King aspects of King James English needed to be updated to suit early 19th century readership. It does not automatically follow that he would advocate for quote that he would quote advocate for new modern versions of Scripture as Truth Time Radio has asserted. Webster did not remove whole verses and passages as do the critical text and modern versions. Rather, Webster updated orthography and grammar of the King James Bible based on developments in the English language after 1611. To say slash infer that Webster would approve of the wholesale textual changes made by modern versions is a leap in logic that cannot be proved. In fact, in a section of the preface not cited by Truth Time Radio, Webster is careful to state the following, quote, In the present version, referring to the King James, the language is, in general, correct and perspicuous. The, ge the genuine popular English of Saxon origin, particularly adopted to the subjects and in many passages uniting sublimely and beautifully and beautiful simplicity. In my view, the general style of the version ought not to be altered. This bespeaks light revision, not modern version advocacy. So True Time Radio is trying to paint Noah Webster here as a full-blown modern version advocate on the basis of the fact that he did revise some things uh, to cohere with more of a early 19th century understanding of spelling, grammar, and other things. Now, I'm not advocating for these changes that Webster has done. I'm simply pointing out here that Truth Time Radio is not being honest or fair in how they are painting Webster. They cannot sustain what they've said here, that Webster would have been a modern version advocate on the basis of the revisions that he made. Furthermore, going to Truth Time Radio, furthermore, he refers to the fact that the words contained in the King James Bible do not reflect the current dialect spoken, uh, spoken of in his time as evil, which he intended to remedy. The quote above from the preface, see the green highlighting, does not support the following statement by Truth Time Media, Radio. Quote, he refers to the fact that the words contained in the King James Bible did not reflect the current dialogue spoken of his time. Webster's statement about, quote, common and popular usage from page three from the preface was not talking merely about, quote, spoken dialects but the totality of communication, both spoken and written. It was Jess McHugh in the article that Truth Time Radio plagiarized that spoke of dialects. So here we see McHugh's influence reaching into what Truth Time Radio is writing. There is nothing in the preface or introduction to the Webster Bible where he's talking about cohering the Bible to spoken dialects. That is language and thinking that Truth Time Radio is getting from Jess McHugh's article. Now, moving on, page six. This, this is an easily researched fact and would take a large amount of time and space to address. Instead, let's dig a little deeper into the final work of Noah Webster, his thankfully unsuccessful attempt to change the words in the book to suit the words in his dictionary. Where did Webster actually say that he was changing, quote, words in the book, i.e. the Bible, to suit the words in his dictionary? We cannot find any such statement in the preface or introduction to the Webster Bible. So again, Truth Time Radio is asserting that Webster revised the Bible so that it would suit the dictionary. Where does he say this? Where does he say that that's what he was doing? We would like to know where Webster explicitly said that because we certainly can't find it. So here again, we see where motives are being ascribed to Webster uh, by Truth Time Radio 
that we cannot find evidence of Webster actually thinking. So again, this is another element of misdirection. We could come down here also. Notice this section. And yet we have the man, Noah Webster, who made it his life's work not only to utter those phrases concerning the King James Bible, there's some stuff quoted above, you can read it on your own, but also to take his biases so far as to call it vulgar. So the first thing I want you to notice here is Truth Time Radio is applying this statement, some of these statements to Webster, to the totality of the Bible, not just to specific or individual words or phrases, right? To call it vulgar, offensive, indecent, impure, undignified, erroneous in translation, and even evil. Webster's Webster thought, thought it his moral duty to correct these things, and as a result, produce his own version of the Bible. Now, this is extremely interesting. Let's come over here to the right margin. This statement on the part of Truth Time Radio stretches credulity. Truth Time Radio is applying select verbiage that Noah Webster used regarding certain individual words and or phrases to the King James Bible in general. So what they're doing is they're taking things that Webster said, particularly here about vulgar and offensive, about certain words and, and applying it to the totality of the Bible itself and making out and making the readers think that, truth to, that, that Webster thought the entire King James Bible was vulgar, offensive, indecent, impure, undignified, or erroneous in translation. All right, that's what they're doing. So let's come back over here. In, uh, so, Truth Time Radio is applying select verbiage that Webster used regarding certain individual words and or phrases to the King James Bible in general. In fact, many of the words found in quotation marks such as indecent, impure, and undignified cannot even be found in Webster's preface or introduction. I am going to leave a link in the description to this digital copy of the Webster Bible. I challenge anybody listening to this video to search the terms indecent, impure, and undignified and show me where he actually, number one, where did he actually use those terms? And number two, um, where does he use the where does he use those in the preface to refer to the entirety of the King James Bible? All right. They cannot even be found in Webster's preface and introduction. Rather, Truth Time Radio has mangled Webster's words to cast him in the worst possible light as a King James Bible hater. Talk about, quote, banking on the fact that research will not be done and their narrative will carry the day. See this pink highlighting down here. The irony is not lost on us. This is exactly what True Time Radio is doing, i.e. banking on the fact that their readership will take their word for it and not check Webster's Bible for themselves. True Time Radio has put words in quotes indecent, impure, undignified, they have put words in quotes that Webster never actually said. He never actually said these things. They put them in quotes and said that Noah Webster said these things about the entirety of the King James Bible. True Time Radio has uh, put, True Time Radio puts words in quotes that ne Webster never actually said while failing to use quotation marks throughout their blog post for words they copy and pasted from other authors. You cannot make this stuff up, folks. The level of subterfuge and dishonesty that is engaged in here is mind-boggling and astounding from a ministry calling itself Truth Time Radio. Now let's go to page 7. In page 7, there is something from the preface and introduction here about uh, some of the changes that Webster made. I'm not going to read all this stuff to you in green. You can read it yourself, but I do want to interact with this just a bit. Are any of these changes, and I'm talking only about these right here visible on the screen that I have highlighted in green. There's a few further down, which I'm not referring to in this comment. Are any of these changes substantive? Do any of them alter the substantive, substantive doctrinal content of a verse? The history of the King James Bible text between 1611 and 1769 reveals that revisions like these were being made for nearly 200 years. 
For example, changes in the use of ye and you were still being made to the text as late as 1769. In many of these cases, later editors were undoing the choices of the translators themselves. Lawrence M. Vance, author of The Text of the King James Bible, documents 42 cases in Paul's epistles alone where the 1611 reads you and later editions read ye. See pages 196 to 198 of Vance's work. When compared to Manuscript 98, one of the surviving primary work-in-progress documents left behind the, by the translators, it is clear that you was the choice of the translators in these 42 verses. Yet modern printings of the standard 6, 1769 text read ye in these 42 verses. If True Time Radio is going to condemn Webster as an evil imperialist for these types of grammatical uh, slash spelling changes, they must, as a matter of logical consistency, falsify every printing of the King James text outside of 1611. This is but one example. This you, ye thing I'm referring to here is only one example of this principle. This is but one example of many that could be cited. These are textual and historical facts that True Time Radio has already dismissed as, quote, BS. And here we can see in their comment here, we are not going to promote BRs, BS of the history of the text, nor his take on social justice. So very interesting that they would bring up the topic of social justice there, given the nature of the McHugh article that they are plagiarizing and the way they are casting Noah Webster in this article and extending McHugh's argumentation and, and portraying him as an evil imperialist and a New England linguistic Nazi who just wants everybody to speak like him. An idea, by the way, that is coming from the uh, forgotten founding father, and um, I would challenge them again to provide that documentation. Coming down now to the end of this article, they talk about Webster, they talk about his dictionary. Did No Webster get some things right in his 1820 dictionary? Of course he did. And of those things he got right, you might be able to gain some further insight into certain terms. But you also may get quite a few things wrong. Should you rely on his understanding as your final authority concerning the scripture? The saying goes, even a broken clock is right twice a day. But the broken clock will only give you the correct time for two out of 1,440 minutes. The takeaway lesson, use scriptural discernment from the King James Bible in all your studies. I just want to point out here that comparing Webster's dictionary to a broken clock is an example of the false equivalence fallacy. All right. It's just it, it's a ridiculous comparison to compare it to that of a broken clock. It's a false equivalence fallacy. And you can uh, learn more about that. This link will also be available in the description uh, for this particular video. Now, at the end, they talk about, question, with this unpopular information in mind, understanding his own ideology, how his own ideology influenced his life's work, knowing the biases he, he possessed and getting some insight into his theological beliefs and his not-so-hidden agenda, how can a person who calls uh, themselves a King James Bible believer in good conscience continue to blindly support the work of Noah Webster in regards to to understanding God's word. So let's come up here and interact with this. It is interesting that True Time Radio would, would appeal to, quote, good conscience in a blog post that is largely not even their own work. How can one support and trust the work of a ministry that publicly engages in ad hominem attacks, questions people's salvation, omits relevant definitions slash information, gaslights, misdirects, projects, and plagiarizes the work of others? Just because Noah Webster edited the King James Bible text in his 1833 Bible in ways that modern King James advocates, including myself, would not approve of, does not falsify the definitions presented in the dictionary that bears his name. See, understand, that is the motive here, ultimately, is to falsify his dictionary. Just whacked myself in the head, sorry about that. To falsify his dictionary. Just because he edits this, in ways that King James Bible believers, including myself, wouldn't approve of, 
doesn't mean that the definitions presented in the American Dictionary of the English Language are wrong. Likewise, for the fact that Webster was a Calvinist. Who cares if Webster was a Calvinist? The King James Bible was translated by high church bishops of the Anglican Church and Puritan Calvinists, both of which baptize infants. Yet Truth Time Radio holds to the absolute infallibility of the King James Bible. Is Truth Time Radio willing to apply the logic used in this blog to the King James Bible itself? Are they willing to do this? I have a list right here. The following King James Bible translators are known, documentable Calvinists. Miles Smith, the gentleman who wrote the preface. John Reynolds, the gentleman who first floated the idea of the King James Bible at the Hampton Court Conference. Thomas Holland, Daniel Fairclaw, George Abbott, John Hamer, Samuel Ward, all are known and avowed Calvinists, yet they translated the King James Bible. But you're supposed to not trust Webster because he was a Calvinist. Is Truth Time Radio willing to apply the same argumentation that they are using in this blog to the King James Bible itself? Because if they do, they're going to have to, on the same grounds, conclude a problem with the King James Bible. In fact, Samuel Ward testified in 1618 at the sign out of Dort to the process used by the King James Bible at a meeting of the Dutch Reformed Church. So the, they are Calvinists. Is True Time Radio willing to apply the logic used in this blog to the King James Bible itself? Are they? Oh, oh and by the way, three of these Calvinists, Miles Smith, uh, I didn't mention Lancelot Andrews because he was an Anglican, but Miles Smith, Lancelot Andrews, and John Reynolds, two of whom were Calvinists in the list I just gave, as well as Lancelot Andrews, another translator, all believed they were born again. I showed you that in the first video, my response to the history teacher barks back. So, is True Time Radio willing to apply the logic used in this blog post to the King James Bible itself? If this blog, in this blog post, True Time Radio has utilized a fallacy known as non sequitur, a Latin phrase meaning it does not follow. Just because Webster was a Calvinist and edited his own Bible, it does not follow that the definitions presented in his dictionary are only correct, quote, twice a day. Dictionaries merely record the meaning and usage of words unless one can prove that a given word did not mean what Webster says it did during the time period in question appeals to his theology and Bible are meaningless misdirection. True Time Radio is really good at misdirecting people. They're also really good at withholding information. What exactly is Truth Time Radio talking about in the final paragraph down here that we're interacting with? Talk about erecting straw men. Can Truth Time Radio identify a single King James Bible believer who claims infallibility for Noel Webster's American Dictionary of the English Language? I would like for them to point to somebody who is making that claim. Moreover, can Truth Time Radio identify a single King James Bible believer who, quote, by, blindly advocates for the exclusive use of Webster's 1828 Dictionary when conducting, quote, extra-biblical research into the meaning and usage of words in the King James Bible? Meanwhile, Truth Time Radio has failed to acknowledge or honestly engage with the 16th and 17th century entomological evidence for the meaning and usage of the word regeneration presented in our written response and YouTube video from April 7 in response to their blog post from March 20 titled, What Happens When You Put a History Teacher Above God's Word? Again, who is this mythological person that Truth Time Radio is addressing that clings to Noah Webster as their final, quote, final authority covering the scriptures? Who is this person? I would like to know who this person is. So the very argumentation is True Time Radio willing to take. The very argumentation about Noah Webster being a Calvinist and born again, that they're using to undermine Webster and apply it to the King James Bible. And who are they talking about here? Who is this person who is claiming the sorts of things that True Time Radio is claiming? The real practice in question is the private defining of words contrary to to their historically verifiable meanings via private interpretation without any explicit support in the King James Bible. See our response to the True Time Radio's uh, blog post, The History Teacher Barks Back, 
for more information. Folks, this blog, Noel Webster, the King James, Calvinist King James Bible Corrector, is a terribly plagiarized blog with a woke flavor, utilizing terrible argumentation, assigning things to Webster that they have no evidence that Webster actually believed. And it's a character assassination on Noah Webster that is designed ultimately to convince the listener, the reader, that you cannot trust Webster's dictionary. Now, I don't know who is holding to Webster's dictionary as a final authority, but if you are going to say that a definition in Webster's dictionary is wrong, you have to prove historically where that word did not mean what Webster is saying it meant. And the fact that Webster included defi- included in his definitions uh, word usage examples from the King James Bible shows the immense influence of the King James Bible on American culture, not an attempt to undermine it. Now, does Webster make revisions that I would that I do not approve of? Yes, he does. But that is a far cry from saying he would be a modern version advocate. So, so this is a character assassination piece on Noah Webster, and the question is why? Why would True Town Radio do this? Why would they use this type of argumentation to uh, to besmirch Noah Webster? It has to do with the dictionary. In the next video, I will address why I think there is a uh, necessary motive here to undermine Webster's dictionary. I'll deal with that in the next video. I want to thank you for listening. If you have uh, enjoyed this video, if you would consider uh, liking, subscribing, leaving a comment, sharing this video, uh, we would certainly appreciate that. What matters most in all of your life and all of eternity is whether or not you are saved, whether or not you have trusted the finished work of Jesus Christ as the only total complete payment for your sin. Jesus Christ died on the cross, shed his blood, was buried and rose again. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 through 4 is the only total complete payment for your sin. When you trust Jesus Christ, his death, burial, and resurrection as the only payment for your sin, you will receive eternal life as a free gift. You will pass from death to life. You'll be taken out from under the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of his dear son. You'll receive the Holy Spirit as a down payment of your redemption until the day of redemption. Trust Jesus Christ today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for your attention.